When I came to you with those calculations, we thought we might start a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. Mm, I remember it well. What of it? I believe we did. In Oppenheimer, Chris Nolan gives his longtime collaborator Killian Murphy the role of a lifetime, one where he doesn't have a bag on his head. In a movie that somehow manages to elevate already powerful elements to new heights, like how a famous quote with oomph is now given even more oomph. Read the words. And now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. To cut to the chase, Oppenheimer is an incredible movie. It's probably gonna do a Morbius sweep at the awards. Best picture, production, music, all of it. And thus, there's a lot of positives here to discuss. All the acting and character work, for example, is amazing, especially with Oppenheimer the man, who I personally relate to a lot. You know, I, Phil, basically am the Oppenheimer of the digital age. Just like him, I created something magnificent yet incredibly destructive that has since gotten out of my control. Something I don't know if I can go on with anymore. No, it was, it was me. But more about that later. For now, hands down the most impressive part about Oppenheimer is the screenplay, which is some of the most ingenious and intricate film writing in years. Oh, Whose work is this? To be clear, the most complex script ever written is probably Primer, and Oppenheimer isn't Primer. It's pretty simple to follow. But still, this is perhaps the most movie movie we've ever seen. You know, a movie, a moving picture. It's a movie that moves. It's three hours long, yet somehow it all goes by like a blur. And while I have covered the topic of time before, this time it's different. See, unlike with most fast Hollywood blockbusters, this movie cannot move on screen. There are no chases or fights or shootouts or anything of the kind. All there is is people standing and sitting around to talk. And yet, somehow, Oppenheimer generates more emotion from that than the biggest action blockbusters. But how? Well, my theory is that the movie screenplay has been built the same way that the atomic bomb is built in the movie. It consists of multiple parts, multiple timelines that constantly collide with each other and themselves to create this endless chain reaction of energy propelling the audience through the three hour runtime in form of smaller points on the runtime, mid sized sections on the runtime, and larger portions on the runtime. But of course, that's just a theory and theory will only take you so far. So today, let's test this theory out and see how exactly Oppenheimer makes itself move so fast. How to create the ultimate movie movie. The smallest reaction of motion here occurs in form of unanswered questions that the audience becomes hooked to get an answer for, again and again and again. For example, one of the most central questions of the movie gets asked near the beginning, when Oppenheimer is offered a position at Princeton after the Manhattan Project by the head of the Atomic Energy Commission, Strauss. In short, Oppenheimer isn't being too respectful to Strauss. Strauss was once a lonely shoe salesman. This is one of the most prestigious appointments in the country. Yes, it's a great commute. That's why I'm considering it. And when he then talks with Albert Einstein outside, he seems to have soured even him on this non-scientist guy. Albert. And that question right there begins the rift between these two men that ultimately develops into jealousy and rivalry and even betrayal. The question of what well, did Oppenheimer say to Albert Einstein to shake him to the core and apparently turn him along with other scientists against this guy? I need to know. Of course, the answer to that question doesn't come until the very end, which alone doesn't work because the audience doesn't have the patience to be blue-balled for three hours. Which is why the movie keeps doing this more and more. The experience is essentially a long line of questions and answers across timelines. 
To start from the film's beginning, old man Oppenheimer is apparently being interrogated by someone for something. Well, what for and why? And who is this woman sitting ominously behind him? What is this? And how is Strauss's hearing connected to it? Is this some kind of clash for power between them? I, I wanna know. Oh, but now young Oppenheimer has poisoned his douchebag professor's apple at his university. Well, what's gonna happen with that? You know, we listen to a boring lecture, except it's not boring because we're thinking about the apple. We do boring character build up with the lecture next morning, except it's not boring because the poisoned apple is right there. Uh oh, what's gonna happen? Aha, luckily nothing. Oppenheimer deals with it. Oh, but now we hear from old man Strauss that the government was looking into Oppenheimer even before his name meant anything because of his apparent left-wing ties. Well, is there truth to that? Was that justified? Was or is Oppenheimer a, a C-word? Aha, uh -huh. now we learn that the mystery woman from the old man Oppenheimer timeline is someone he met in the past as he was making a name for himself as a quantum physics professor. She was the kind of wife material that his on and off again C-word girlfriend couldn't be. Aha, uh -huh. now we learn that Oppenheimer wasn't a C-word, he didn't join the party, he just sympathized with people holding those ideologies. More than anything, it was a matter of circumstance. But oh, now it turns out that it ultimately didn't matter. Someone eventually dug up Oppenheimer's past to destroy his influence in the post-war world. Apparently some whatever official wrote the report, but that's not it. Someone leaked those files to him. Someone close to Oppenheimer with access to his past wanted to destroy him. Well, who was that? I need to know. Oh, but now that young Oppenheimer is gearing up to build the atom bomb, there's a bit of a hiccup. This time the chain reaction doesn't stop. It would ignite the atmosphere. Oops. Yeah, what if the nuclear reaction doesn't stop? What if the world catches on fire? Well, I need to see what happens. What do they do about that? Aha, uh -huh. Strauss's cabinet hearing is about him running for secretary of commerce. The senate will either agree or deny him based on his past. And aha, uh -huh. in the past, Strauss wasn't just an innocent bystander in the Oppenheimer security clearance case. He's had disagreements with him that he's still influenced by. There was the quarrel about the creation of the H-bomb after the A-bomb. But oh, now we also hear that an unnamed scientist will testify in this hearing, either against Strauss or for him. Well, who is that? What will they say? I need to know. But oh, now we learn that an anti c word army man is closing in on Oppenheimer during the creation of the A-bomb. And that there was also some kind of incident with his ex c word girlfriend. And something about a spy at Los Alamos. Well, how will he survive this guy? And who is the spy? And what does Oppenheimer mean he never saw his ex again? What happened? I need to know. I never saw her again. What? No, 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 what? Don't do it, Shepard. Don't. Don't do it, Shepard. I hope you're getting my point because this goes on and on and I can't cover it all. But the gist of what I'm saying is that this movie is basically a three hour long Q&A session. There are constant questions to make the audience look forward to the future and there are constant answers to make the audience feel a sense of progression from the past. There is no motion on screen, but there is in the story. It's endless momentum. And with that being said, I guess now's the time to answer the question I brought up in the beginning about me and Oppenheimer and the future of this channel. Basically, I am Oppenheimer of the YouTube era. Whereas he created the atomic bomb, I created something equally destructive. A series of negative clickbaity movie videos that inspired all other creators to put the word failure on pretty much every title and thumbnail. And I've gotten so much flack for it that I regret it, that I feel like there's blood on my hands. It's all about me. And so I will be nuking this series and copyright striking everyone else. You'll understand more in this video's ending section. However, if you're an Oppenheimer and Filmento hater, 
Bad news. Despite all your warranted angry comments on Twitter and Reddit, sadly, I'm not gonna get any repercussions because this isn't court. Right, they're not convicting. Nobody can get me to court. Every time someone is onto me, I just press this blue button and it changes my IP address to another country and encrypts my data in a way that no hacker or government can get to it. And I'm just gonna live a nice life with this button. I'll access all geologged content on all streaming services and websites to watch everything without restrictions. I'll download things online like pictures of cute c-word girls without anyone knowing I'm doing it. Oh. I'll even get better online deals by switching to a location where the price is cheaper. You can't keep getting away with it! The good news is that you can do the same by getting your own blue bun. It's Surfshark, the number one VPN probably created by Oppenheimer himself. So if you're one of the few unfortunate souls who doesn't have a VPN yet, now's a good time to try. Because Surfshark is running a Black Weekend filmento deal of 85% off with multiple free months by using code FILM. Get the VPN or the more expensive version, you can't go wrong with either. The mid-sized reaction of motion here occurs in form of specific events defined by a goal and an obstacle in front of it. To start from the beginning, young Oppenheimer is studying science in Cambridge. But the problem is that he's not being taken seriously. He hates his life there, to the point of even thinking of throwing it all away. And to overcome that problem, he must leave Cambridge and go elsewhere to discover himself as he discovers science, to make a name for himself. That's the purpose of this section, so to speak. The bulls seem to an alpha delta in that home. After that, we move to the next section. And how do you know it's the next section? Well, because the goal and obstacle have changed to something else. Now, Oppenheimer returns to the US to build up a faculty of quantum physics, but again, with an issue in the way. The issue that not only must he do much of the building alone, but also that many people don't want him to build any higher because of his ties to... A good example of this being his girlfriend, who's a living definition of yes, but. Yes, she's a 10, but she's a crazy cunt. And so, to overcome this issue, Oppenheimer must move on from her and and focus solely on science. Well, I haven't joined the party. They won't let me bring you onto the project because of this. So if you could just be a little more pragmatic. Well, as you don't have to worry, it's done. After that, the next section. And how do you know it's the next section? Exactly. The purpose has shifted. We're trying to build up a secret community of scientists to construct an atom bomb before the Germans can do it, which naturally comes with a lot of problems. How do you convince the brightest minds to move to the desert for years? How do you organize it all? How do you combine science and military? How do you generate this much groundbreaking information while also ensuring that none of it leaks out? It's a constant battle. Why would you think I'd do that? How about because this is the most important thing to ever happen in the history of the world? And it does ultimately succeed. The work on the A-bomb is finished, and we move to the next section. Yes, there is a bomb, but now it must be successfully tested in time for the president to flex with it in an upcoming ally meeting, which is a bit of an issue because the deadline day is ravished by heavy storm. Okay, so we gotta deal with that. 5.30, 5.30, We gotta trust that the detonation works despite the weather and prepare for what happens if it doesn't work. That's the current purpose. Overall, what I'm getting at is that this three-hour movie consists of multiple mini-movies, which is why it doesn't feel three hours long. You know, we're now so invested in testing the bomb that we forget that we've actually been doing other stuff leading up to the bomb for the past two hours. We don't feel the length because the length isn't one continuous being. And that's very different from other Hollywood blockbusters, which usually establish one main goal and then go through multiple pit stops to get there. Oh, we gotta get the MacGuffin key to control the evil AI. We gotta stop the purple alien from getting the magic stones. We gotta find the heart of Davy Jones. But of course, in a biopic like Oppenheimer, you can't really do that, because human life is rarely driven by just one finish line goal. So instead, the movie accomplishes the same with sectioning. The sections might collide and intertwine and be part of one comprehensive idea, but their borders are made very clear with their own defined 
goals and obstacles. You know, after the A-bomb is tested and used on people, the movie's purpose then shifts into fighting for what the world will be now that the bomb exists. We have to build up. Oh my God. Oh. After that, it becomes a battle for access and survival, a battle of Oppenheimer versus Strauss in different hearing rooms. There is constant motion because even though this is one united movie, we're constantly moving from one mini movie part of it to the next. The largest reaction of motion here occurs in form of topics and themes and emotions that wide portions of the movie exist under. For example, a big reason why many of the movie's characters are able to make an impact without physically doing much on screen is because they're not only characters so much as they're representations of larger ideas. If you look at Oppenheimer's girlfriend again, like I said, she is an embodiment of left-wing ideology. She and the ideology she represents is what this portion of the movie explores, Oppenheimer trying to figure out his place in the world. The same way that he tiptoes around with her, that's what's happening with him and, um... Say the line! <sighs> communism. You know, he sympathizes, but he ultimately cannot commit. And then, at the 30 minute mark, we move on from all that to the next character and idea, military. The Germans have figured out how to split the atom, and suddenly there's a race to building the bomb that will decide the future of the war and the world. That's what General Groves shows up to represent, essentially replacing the girlfriend and what she represented. Those previous characters and elements may still be relevant, yes, but they're not the topic of main importance anymore. Political ideas and Oppenheimer's place in a normal world don't really take precedent now. Now, it's all about shaping the power dynamics of the world. And once it seems like those power dynamics have been successfully shaped, the same thing happens. General Groves and what he embodies fades to the background to be replaced by another topic, bureaucracy. Now, Oppenheimer's scenes revolve primarily around lawyers trying to protect and attack him, presidents refusing to listen to him. Don't let that cry baby back in here. Now, the movie most of all explores regret and consequences and the efforts of making things right. Once again, previous elements do very much appear, but they're not center stage anymore. This is... I feel that I have blood on my hands. And then, once more, the focus shifts into the topic of redemption represented by Strauss. Now it becomes clear that Strauss was always the man behind the curtain. He was the one seeking to destroy Oppenheimer just because he wasn't able to let go. Oppenheimer pours from the scientists against me right from that first meeting. The finale becomes all about a man versus man battle happening in different rooms in different timelines. Just not a battle between the men, but more so between themselves. Strauss loses because he was never able to accept any responsibility or humility or to deal with things as they are. Junior senator from Massachusetts didn't like what you did to Oppenheimer. They don't want me in the cabinet room. Oh, that's... That's fine. Whereas Oppenheimer quote unquote wins because he grows enough to come to grips with the cold hard reality. He created this uncontrollable power and yes, in his regret, he tried desperately to limit and gain control of it. If we did it, they would have to do it. Our efforts would only fuel their efforts just as it had with the atomic bomb. Exactly. No moral scruples in 1945, plenty in 1949. And now, as a changed man, he has learned to accept the most important lesson in all of human existence. It is what it is. We thought we might start a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. I believe we did. Just like with the earlier points, this is a brief explanation. But what I'm getting at is that the movie is divided into these portions, or acts even, that vary emotionally. Act 1 is about one thing, Act 2A is about another thing, Act 2B and Act 3 about another. You know, things and people on screen aren't moving. It's the same cast of characters as before. But what has moved or changed is their meaning. Characters in the third act feel entirely unlike the same characters in the second act because they exist under circumstances and topics that are very unlike. That's why it all keeps feeling fresh and fast, because emotionally speaking, we're constantly moving. A bit like how this video began with me regretting what I'd created, only to now realize that 
so what? Yes, I created a form of negative clickbait that now burns all over YouTube. But so what? I can't control what others do with what I've created. You can complain about me on Reddit and Twitter all you want, but it is what it is. I am what I am. I am Oppenheimer of the social media age, and I'll keep doing what I do. Oh, and look at that. The video's already over. Meanwhile, I've mastered the atom more than any man alive. Now I'm here to split you like two and three from five. I'm a peaceful man, but I do what I must. You had an